Welcome to Kingdom Life Church and today's message with Drs. Dennis and Jennifer Clark brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its dedicated supporters. We are here to equip you with the how-to tools and practical effective ways for empowering your Christian journey. Join us as we explore teachings that bring healing through forgiveness and ignite transformation in both individuals and families. For more resources, join our mission. Visit us at forgive123.com. Let's embark on this journey together. Welcome, Kingdom Life Church, Full Stature Ministries. This morning, and Team School. That's right. You know, uh, there's a, a lot of people that have followed us for many years, but the best way to learn is not the hit and miss messages, but to go on to school and in an orderly fashion, module one, module two, module three, module four. It's designed for that purpose, to teach you step by step. And it always reminded me of uh, geometry. You have to get the basics before you can do advanced. Same with algebra, right? You have to learn algebra before you can do advanced algebra. And uh, a lot of our teaching would be best appreciated if you had the basic, uh, the basic foundation. Uh, years ago, we did a we did a message called a focus challenge, and I'm feeling that what the God's saying to the church right now is that I'm going to teach my teach my people to focus. So what we're going to do is we're going to really review just how do I go about focusing and what is the benefit of it and all. And um, I want to start with. The definition of focus. I think we picked this up in one of our prayer meetings, and I really enjoyed it. The definition of focus is to behold with sustained attention. To behold with sustained attention means you're not going to deviate. You're going to hang on to it and go, I'm staying there. I'm going to sustain my attention. And, of course, the way the Lord taught me many years ago, You give power to what you give attention to. And I saw people that were in very difficult situations actually kind of get their bearings back. I had a young uh, girl that was uh, anorexic, and she was going to get professional help. And and, um, part of the breakthrough, even with her professional help, was she said, my pastor says that you give power to what you give attention to. And he said, that's right, and that's what we're going to work with with you. (laughs) And she started making progress. Uh, The... You give power to what you give attention to. And uh, something that was brought to my attention recently, Jason was mentioning something, is that even when, even when you are focused on the attention, it doesn't stop distractions. You know, you can be, you can be focused on all the right stuff and still have distractions. They're in the atmosphere and that's a part of life. And we can learn to overcome the distractions more readily. Uh, so we want to learn to cultivate, and that's a product of the Spirit. The focus I'm talking about is, is a product of the Spirit, to behold with sustained attention. And uh, for me, I needed to have that need met for attention. I don't know about you, but uh, my, my life was a lot of rejection. And so what I needed was attention. But you can pull on people to get the attention doesn't work. It'll never satisfy. It's a craving. All it'll do is you'll need more and get frustrated with the lack of satisfaction that's in it. But I went directly to God, and and he started revealing scriptures to me, little by little, on, on him wanting to meet that need rather than me trying to meet an unmet need. And all of us have were... Um, that have been born again, you still have unmet needs. And identifying them and getting them met righteously through Jesus is primary. Um, But you do this by exercising your spirit. Here's where God started with me, and this is where I believe focus can really, uh, you can really learn to appreciate and, and drink in that divine nature and let it be written on the tablet of your heart. But in the Living Bible Translation, uh, Psalm 139, verses 17 and 18. And I believe that, uh, I think I started my Christian walk, I had a living Bible, so that's probably why 
uh, some of those early scriptures came out of that context. But listen, this was God speaking to Dennis, and this is God speaking to you as well. How precious it is, Lord, to realize you are thinking about me constantly. For someone who has ignored their whole life, how precious it is, Lord, to realize, somebody's getting a healing right now just hearing this, that you are thinking about me constantly. I can't even count how many times a day your thoughts turn toward me. And when I awaken in the morning, you're still thinking about me. I think everyone ought to put that one on their refrigerator. And when you wake up in the morning, you say, this is a day, another day to love God and receive that fact that he's thinking about you constantly. You know how many people we dealt with over the years that said, where's God? How come God did? How come? He never left. You got distracted and you, left. you found a way to leave by an excuse or what have you, but you found a way. Because he says, my thoughts are continually toward you. That means even while you're sleeping. He doesn't sleep. He is bombarding you with his undivided attention. How precious it is, Lord, to realize you're thinking about me constantly. I can't even count how many times a day your thoughts are toward me. I awake and you're still thinking me. The scriptures say, you're they're more numerous than the grains of the sands of the sea. Think about a walk on the beach. How many individual grains of sands? Those are the thoughts that God, an omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient God, is thinking toward us at any given moment. He is not clueless. He is not absent. He is not without solutions. We need to become a solution-oriented people, but in doing so, we've got to go to the source. Remember, wisdom is a product of your spirit. Knowledge is a product of the head. You've got to go to the and utilize and exercise your spirit. You need to go to the proper organ. Much time is wasted figuring stuff out in your head. Much, much time. When God says, I'm here and I'm available, Ask. If any of you lack wisdom, ask. But if you're not asking, you're going to figure it out. That's pride. That's like saying, I'm smarter than God. Wisdom is the principal thing. What does principal thing mean? It means the most important. So go for the wisdom, not the knowledge, because in wisdom, he'll inform your brain with all kinds of creativity. I, I marvel at the concept of the creativity of the human spirit. Uh, you know, I, I uh, watching an old old MacGyver movie, and I see how creative he was. And I said, you know what? That's kind of a picture of what God has. If we would pursue wisdom, that creativity is unlimited. He could cause us to do things with things that we didn't even know, but they're available. But you have not because you ask not, or you ask and you don't receive because you ask amiss. You're just on your preferences, on your wants, and your desires of the flesh. God is saying if you would desire wisdom, wisdom would release the creativity that is necessary for life. And you would find yourself rejoicing and utilizing things that were commonplace. You could rejoice in the fact that I've got the pearl of great price on the inside of me. I'm a wealthy man. Huh? I'm a wealthy man. I've got the pearl of great price on the inside. That's, that, I'd sell it all to have him. He sold it all to have us. So reciprocation simply means that we're sons and daughters of God. And we want to. It's a want to, not a have to. That's the difference between wisdom and knowledge. Knowledge, what was it that Thomas Saul said? Wisdom, our intellect plus bad judgment, minus, minus judgment, equals foolishness. So it's not about having a high IQ. It's not about having great knowledge. Intellect minus judgment, what we would say discernment, equals foolishness. Discernment is a product of love. 
Discernment is to perceive and, and to hold loosely into your hands to look for God's creativity for a redemptive solution. It's different than judging. Discerning is to hold loosely in your hands, release love for a creative solution. Least case, release love. Let it flow as intercession. But God's creativity is available, and I believe he wants to stir up the saints. But he's going to have to teach us, he's going to have to challenge us to learn how to refocus. Because you can be focused and still have distractions. So let's, let's take this uh, and exercise our spirits this morning and say, God, I'm going to pursue a healthier focus. Um, the number one organ of use is your spirit. Uh, your spirit joined to his spirit. That's the new creation. Now, the way God taught me uh, in the early days, and I used this pattern in um, probably four out of five sermons are going to have this in it, whether it's stated or not. And that is, God said, for every truth, for every reality, for every good thing that I reveal to you, every good thing, I know, Dennis, that your passion is to know how do I cultivate that, and I am more than willing to tell you how to cultivate it. The question is, you're willing. <laughs> are you willing to be willing? That's a good place. Some people need to start right there because they're, they're comfortable in their ignorance, like it's bliss. No, it's not. <laughs> you're an accident going somewhere to happen, and you're going to cause yourself, listen to this, unnecessary trials and tribulations. It's like going out in a, in a thunderstorm without an umbrella. That's unnecessary trials and tribulations. Yeah, it rains on the just and the unjust. It rains on everybody, but that's silly. Take an umbrella. Otherwise, you're involving yourself in unnecessary trials and tribulations. In this world, you have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've removed its ability to harm you. So what you choose. You want unnecessary. Anyhow, I could just see people going, oh, I need some unnecessary tribulations. My life is you know, my, it's been much too easy for weeks now. Huh? No. So we're going to learn to focus. So what God said was, Dennis, I'm going to give you your undivided attention. It's one of the first blessings I'm going to give you. It's going to heal rejection. Rejection is going to be so foreign to you that it's like you go, what's that? The only way I know rejection is when I can perceive someone else hurting in it. But in reality, God gave me his undivided attention. His thoughts, how precious. He's thinking about me constantly. It's kind of hard to hide when you have a revelation that God is thinking about you constantly. We try, but I'll tell you what, you go, nah. let's get back, let's get back and experience my spirit. So for me, the undivided attention was the reality, and I believe he wants that for you as well. He wants to give you that undivided attention that Dennis is no different than anybody else, that God is thinking about you constantly. Let's do something with that. Let's focus on that, that he's thinking about me constantly. I'm not hidden. I'm not his little uh, orphan child where everybody gets favor but me. All of, those, all of those things are distractions that have tried to bring you into a realm of unnecessary trial and tribulation. So he took and said, here is your God focus, Dennis. And this is good for anybody. It's scripture. Scripture is good for everybody, right? I'm giving you the Dennis story, but the Dennis story is supposed to be imparting to you a, a hearty want-to for yourself. And he says, I've given you this truth. I've given you this undivided attention. I've bathed your spirit in it. But here's what your determined purpose has to be, Dennis. This is what you need to do about that. You need to cultivate that focus. It needs to become a God focus. A God focus. My determined purpose is, and he used the Amplified Bible, for my determined purpose. Who's he talking about here? Well, that's me. Yeah, it was Paul's writing, but that was me. 
I've just received this gift of undivided attention from God. It made me cry. I, I welcomed it. I, I, how profound for someone who was ignored and invisible. All of a sudden, now God's given me his undivided attention and his thoughts are continually toward me. Whew. Okay, I could receive it, but God said, don't stop there. For my determined purpose is that I might know him the one who gave me that, the loving Father who gave me that undivided attention, that I might progressively become more deeply and intimately acquainted with him, perceiving and recognizing and understanding all of the wonders of his personhood more strongly and more clearly, to be continually transformed in spirit into his likeness, what that was saying is, Dennis, I've given you my undivided attention, and you know how good that feels to know that my thoughts are continually towards you. But uh, there's something on your part that needs to be done, and that is you need to pursue it. You can't just receive it, enjoy it, and do nothing about it. I want you to have a passion to reciprocate. When you really receive a love gift from God, you want to reciprocate. And that was the, how God says, this is how I'm going to take that revelation and cultivate it. This is how you're going to reciprocate. You're going to pursue me. That's going to, as a matter of fact, I told Jennifer, I, I was probably one of them strange new converts. I never asked for stuff. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying I never asked for stuff. I only asked for Philippians 3.10, that I might know him. I wanted reality. I didn't need stuff. You know, you can go get a part-time job and get some additional stuff, you know. But he was telling me that, that undivided attention, that constant delight in me that is there even when I awaken every morning. I awaken every morning. He awakens my ear to hear as a disciple, as, a, as someone who is going to have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying. I'm going to cultivate that, Dennis, but you pursue this one thing. My determined purpose is that I might know him. Somebody... If somebody sent you, you know, I don't know about you, but uh, if I had a secret admirer who sent me something, it would frustrate me. I'd appreciate the gift, but I want to know who that is. Wouldn't you? Wouldn't you be curious mm -hmm. if you got a secret admirer? Well, God is our secret admirer. I want to find out more about him. He's giving me great and precious promises that I might be a partaker of that divine nature, I want to reciprocate. I don't, I don't understand selfish people, to tell you the truth. To me, any act of love for me makes me want to reciprocate. So he's, here's how you reciprocate. You seek me, progressively become more deeply acquainted with the wonders of your This one thing. And what was uh, the, the test the Lord gave me so that I wouldn't go into la-la land and be super spiritual and really just make it all up in a fantasy. He said, I'm going to give you a revelation. I'm going to teach you how to cultivate your responsibility to cultivate that truth. But then I'm going to call you on the carpet and say, Dennis, is it working? Is there fruit? If you can't answer that, then apparently you need to get back to step one and start pursuing him. But the fruit that I recognized with just that one truth, that undivided attention, was that when I drew near to God, he drew near to me. Madame, uh, Madame Goyon had a term, she called it the law of central tendency, which was really, my term would be gravity. Draw nigh to God by your spirit, not your head. You draw nigh to God, he draws nigh to you. That union and that communion, he is like a magnet. And one of the best pictures of that love relationship was the prodigal and the father. He said, then in many ways, Dennis, your, your heart's like the prodigal. It's way out there somewhere. And I want to draw you in with cords of love. All you have to do is turn. Isn't that what the prodigal had to do? He had to turn. Repent means to turn around and move in a new direction. It's a change of heart attitude. And when you turn, the part that I loved the most was some people would say, oh, the good shepherd, he, he goes after that lost sheep. But did you notice the father sat and waited? The father did not go to the pig pen looking for him. Wouldn't have done any good. There's times when that doesn't work. 
No. In reality, what happened was when he started to come back, when he started to draw near to the Father, the Father came running to him. Draw nigh to God, he will draw nigh to you. Do you see the magnetic power of that? It's multiplied. It's, it's, it's exponential in its love and devotion. You make the proper attempt to focus, and God comes running towards you. The law of central tendency is you drop down to your spirit, you draw nigh to him, and he will embrace you. He will draw nigh to you. Each person is drawn away by lust, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life. You can be drawn away. But if you go, Jesus, greater is he that is in you than he is in the world. It works every time. But you have to make the choice to go to him, draw nigh to him. He'll draw nigh to you and he'll prove himself by having a magnetic pull, a yearning. It's actually called love. He loves to be with you, and he's longing for intimacy. He wants to progressively reveal himself to you. He's not hiding from you. He's hiding for you, for you to pursue, to seek. No. We always used to say, drink, don't think, feed, don't read. <laughs> I mean, it's okay to read, and it's okay to think, but get your priorities to guy. Focus on what is strong. Now, this focus... Philippians 4, 6, and 8. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds. That's a good starting place for prayer, is to have the peace of God first. Otherwise, your, your impulsive wants and desires will rise on the ascendancy. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, think of the noble whatever pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are a good report. If there's any virtue in anything praiseworthy, focus on these things. I think that God's cultivating a, an attitude of gratitude. There is, you can complain about just about anything. You can complain that your sh shoe came untied. But on the other hand, you can also miss the very things that God wants you to be grateful for. Start verbalizing your gratitude. It's an attitude that is a disposition of the heart. And what was the old saying? Uh, life is 90% attitude, 10% circumstances. So a, a person who's focused on God responds to negative circumstances mm -hmm. with more dignity and more humility and less what about me, and it's more about him. How do you want me to respond instead of, oh, no, why did that happen? Why did God let that happen? You know, that puts you up on the throne. Self is being exalted. But we're told to think on these things. In conclusion, brothers, focus your thoughts on what is true, noble, righteous, pure, lovable, admirable, and on some virtue and on something praiseworthy. Think of something praiseworthy. Hebrews 12, 2, stay focused on Jesus who designed and perfected our faith, fixing our eyes. That means focus with sustained attention. It's like lock. It's like lock on it. How do I lock on it? You give power to what you give attention to. The power to lock would be to the degree that you can sustain and as you learn to sustain, we, I, we had to teach people to pray. People that can't sit still, when they learn to pray, even if you take a baby step of progress and say, normally I'm fidgety, but I'm going to, just to honor God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay dropped down a little bit longer. The secular song or stay just a little bit longer. <laughs> All right, stay just a little bit longer. Even if it's a matter of seconds, you're God-honoring, and it will cultivate in you a deeper uh, uh, ability, spiritual ability or aptitude to stay focused. Practice by reason of use, having your senses exercise. How do you exercise your senses? I'm telling you how to exercise your senses. Tuesday is an opportunity where we have our meeting to exercise your senses, what you see, hear, and feel. But it also needs to be a place to where 
you can sit still long enough for something to surface that's not about you. You know, the fruit of the Spirit was not meant to be eaten. The fruit of the Spirit was meant to be given away. And that's a wonderful opportunity to do just that. Okay? So, <clears throat> focus with sustained attention. Psalm 27.4, obviously, Dave, uh, David had this. One thing I have desired of the Lord, and that I will seek, that I might dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Now listen to the word he uses. To behold in the beauty of the Lord and to inquire. Behold first, then inquire. Behold with sustained focus. Then inquire. Because now, you know what you're getting, and, and I think the church needs this more now than ever, is you need to get some of God's prayer requests instead of your own. Because your own seem to be, can be superficial and spun, uh, impulsive. Get into and behold God and what prayer requests come up, pray them. Whatever scriptures come up, pray them. All right? Many, many, uh, when we do uh, decrees and declarations on Sunday morning, there will be some that will seem like they're standing out more than others. Use that as an opportunity to pray it. Nothing stands out a little bit more than something else that isn't God speaking if it's scriptural. Our job is to focus on it and do something with it, not just ignore it. No, when it, uh, focus requires a perspective. And uh, I'm not one for you self-analyzing yourself, but in the spirit of prayer, Paul did it in four directions. He did this himself, and I believe he did it in a healthy way, utilizing his spirit as the criteria not his head. He had, first of all, four perspectives. The first was the inward. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected. Ooh, that was the inward look. Oh, I know one thing. I love God, but I'm not there yet. I'm going to progressively continue to know him, right? I'm, I'm not there yet, but oh, how wonderful it is. But I'm not done yet. I'm being honest with my inward look. I've got a ways to go yet, and I'm going. The forward look. I press that I might lay hold of that for which Messiah Jesus has laid hold of me. Oh, what did he do? He says, Paul, I've appeared for you this purpose to turn people from Satan to God, from darkness to light, and for you to witness, declare, preach those things which I have shown you and, listen to this, and the things that I've yet to show you. That's true to all of us. There's things he showed us, showed us that we are responsible for, but there's things we haven't even seen yet that we have to be making ourselves available to say yes and amen to God. Whatever he shows you in the future, there's things for me to do. The backward look. The backward look is not looking into your past, but it, I do not count myself to apprehend it. But one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. You know, he's really talking about accomplishments. You can't live on the past accomplishments. You've got to say, this one thing I'm doing, I'm going to progressively get to know him more. Well, if you're doing that, you're not locked into old time wonderful things. You're simply saying, well, oh, the time that I did this and the time that I did, well, that's all wonderful testimony. And those things can edify other people. But you can't stay there. You need to say, the things I'm going to be obedient to, the things that you showed me and the things that you are yet to show me. Are you available for that? There's things that he, are, he has not showed you yet, but yet he's called you to do the things that he reveals to you in the days ahead. That keeps you focused with sustained attention. So there's that inward look. I haven't arrived yet. The forward look, I press to lay hold of that which which he's laid hold of me. Things that I don't even know what they are yet, but I'm pressing on forward to those greater things that are out there somewhere, and it's going to happen. The third one is the backward look. I'm not going to live on past accomplishments. I don't need the trophies and all the things of the past, the degrees, 
That's not where my heart is. My heart now is that I press toward the mark of the high calling of God. I press forward, and I am no longer looking backward. I'm looking ahead and upward. I press for the goal of the prize of the upward call in Messiah Jesus. That perspective of an upward look, we should be looking at the levels of the cross and be pursuing the glory. We should be looking at not just the justification. We're moving quite distinctly as a congregation in the second level. It is no longer I that live, but Christ who's living through me. It's no longer I who love. It's no longer I who forgive. We're, we're, we're doing quite well in that middle <laughs> realm. But there's the third realm of glorification. That's sanctification. We're going to need to press in toward the third level of the cross. We need to say, God, you take us. Take us that it's all, it's all you. It starts out with the forgiven life for children. And what are they? It's about me. <laughs> the second level is we. Third level is he. It's just him. And that's a crucifixion of the self. That's not just dealing with sin. That's the, the crucifying self and saying it's no longer I that live. But Christ lives in me. But I also know that um, you can also look at it, the, the three levels of overcoming. Overcoming by the blood of the Lamb, children. By the word of the testimony. That's when you start getting strong as sons and daughters. And it's a we. We together. We overcome. We have victory. You know people who have victory as Christians. You know people who just give lip service to it. Don't you? Sure you do. Well, that second level is important, but there's a third level, and that's, that's where we're forgiven by the blood of Jesus. We've overcome by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of the testimony, but then there's a place where you love not your life unto death, to where you're not afraid to allow the Holy Spirit to take your self-life and say, let it be God, God alone. The cross is for self, so we welcome that. You want the glory? That's part of the price. That's where you want to live. Do you want to live there? Then let's pursue an openness to it. Open up you gates so that the king of glory can come in. It requires you opening the gates. He isn't just going to fall out of the sky on whosoever. No, the inward look, the forward look, the backward look, the upward look. All of those are focusing that require a perspective. Be honest with yourself. Glance in your prayer time. Take all four and just reevaluate. But mostly, when we talk about beholding with sustained attention, we've got to deal with the fact that, uh, let's face it, people are out of focus. You can be out of focus. And the problem is that God says, my grace is sufficient, my power is made perfect in weakness. The problem is the way you view your deficiencies. We've been seeing a lot of quality ministry in this area. People discovering deficiencies and yielding it over for God to become the sufficiency in that area. It becomes God meeting that need righteously rather than you trying to meet that need in your own strength. Now, the problem is the way you view your deficiencies. And you've heard this before in this church. Uh, God can't heal excuses. You have to die to them. You might think they're pretty legitimate excuses, but you're really going to have to die to those excuses. Now, just to give you a few, Jeremiah 1, 6 to 8. Jeremiah, the mighty prophet. I'm too young. You know, you, he could be locked into, I'm too young. If he did not listen to the word of God, and God says, don't say you're too young, <laughs> you can live in that excuse indefinitely and miss focus. And the worst part about missing your focus is that you, you let that excuse forfeit the anointing that God had for you, the call of God on his life. Let's get a little more radical about dealing with your excuses. Everybody's got some kind of an excuse. And, and it can be good or bad. And what's worse is you have a history of it, so you think it's got to be true. 
No, an excuse is an excuse is an excuse, and God can't heal it. So whatever your excuses are, I pray by the power of the Holy Spirit today, He reveals them to your heart. You go to prayer and say, God, is that me? If you can humble yourself like that, you'll see a lot of excuses that you have built in, that you've justified. Once you've justified it, it becomes part of your life, and it has a life of its own. Jeremiah, I'm too young. Moses, if he would have remained in the excuse, do you realize what we would, how much of a loss that would be? Well, God says, you keep your excuses, and it's a loss to the body of Christ. It's selfish. Rather than be what he called you to be and to do the things that he's yet to show you, you'll never see those things because you're living in an excuse. Who am I that I should go? Oh, that's so humble, Moses. That's an excuse, and God's going to deal with you. If you will respond. You don't have to respond. You can keep your excuses. Isn't that sad? You have that ability called a free will to keep your excuses. Gideon, I'm the weakest and the smallest. Oh, mighty man of valor. When you're like this. I'm the weakest and the smallest. Oh, mighty man of God, you have issues, God. <laughs> You're saying nice things about me that I don't believe myself. That's called an excuse. God's saying nice things about you that you don't believe. What are we going to do? We've got to shake you a little bit. <laughs> you need a supernatural spanking. I don't know. Whatever wakes you up. God is saying good things about you, and you've got an excuse standing in the way. It's got to change. I am the weakest and the smallest. Oh, he had, he had two of them. I'm afraid. Duh. Do you know how many times we've heard people say, I'm afraid, because if I try and fail, blah, 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 blah. You know, grow up. I'm afraid. And what are you afraid of? Uh, Joshua. Okay, Joshua, I want you to take over and lead. I want to pull the leadership gold out of you because there's gold in there. People will oppose me. <laughs> Come on, you're laughing when it's somebody else, but guess what? You've got these same things too if you would ask the Holy Spirit. Show me my excuses. That needs to be our battle cry. Kingdom Life Church, Full Stature Ministries, and team. Right? The team... Totally equipping all missionaries, T-E-A-M, and totally, <laughs> I, I get mixed up because we had two meetings for him. Training embassy for advanced ministry. I don't want advanced ministry. I'm just getting by by the skin of my teeth. Why would I want to advance? Oh, then you, that could be an excuse too, right? I don't need that. I already know that. You remember the, when we travel churches to church? The saddest thing was the ones you wanted to pray for, the, the, the biggest basket cases wouldn't open up their ministry. But we even had one lady, she wouldn't open up her ministry, but she was buying everything we had to give to her family. She, <laughs> she was going to change them. And we're going, God's saying, you change. That'll change your family. Let them see. Oh, my goodness. Don't tell them what they should be doing. You, you change. Joshua, people will oppose me. <laughs> Paul, this is my favorite scripture. Dr. Bez, IQ 177, he just loved to get into his scripture. But this one is very simple. He pointed this out to me years ago, and I'm going, that is so cool. Paul, what he must have been thinking, but he doesn't say it. I'm afraid to talk. I'm tired of talking when I'm afraid. These people are mean. Huh? They hurt people that talk about Jesus. Oh, sound like it. Okay, it doesn't say that in the scripture, but here's what it says. Acts 18, 9 and 10. Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the, in the night by a vision. He gives Paul a vision in the night. Do not be afraid. Speak. Do not keep silent, 
for I am with you, and no one will attack you or hurt you, for I have many people in this city. If God appears in a vision to say that, he knew what was going on in that little brain of Paul's. I don't think I'm going to talk. I'm alone in this city. Nobody else is going to help me. They hurt people. I'm, I'm tired of talking. I'm afraid. I don't. Uh, don't be afraid. Speak. Do not keep. You think God would say, fail to discern where Paul was at, and just say that just for the heck of it? Not you, Paul, but for other people. <laughs> don't be afraid, but speak. Do not be silent. I have many people in this city. He had to see God as his ultimate source and to do what God told him to do, to turn the people from Satan to God, from darkness to light. You were called to do that. So to make an excuse, I don't want to talk anymore because people will oppose me, people hurt me. Him and Joshua, yeah. So what do we got to do? Excuses cause you to forfeit your anointing. Yeah, If you're a note taker, you ought to write that down. Your excuses cause you to forfeit the anointing. So don't get mad at God when things aren't, aren't flowing because in reality, your excuses are hindering your own anointing. Your own plans and purposes that God had ordained before the foundation of the earth, that you would walk in them. You're hindering them with excuses. Now, obviously, Jeremiah, Moses, Gideon, Joshua, Paul, um, had deficiencies, and God was calling them on it. So apparently, loss of focus is a temptation that anybody can get, right? And I was sharing this with, with Jason. Jason said he's been hearing a lot of different messages all covering the concept of, of uh, distractions. And all through the Bible, Godly men were distracted. These are godly men, and they were distracted. And don't think the enemy doesn't take that distraction and, and reinforce it by repeating it to you regularly. As a matter of fact, the loss of focus is not only a, an attention. Uh, temptations, and we've taught this before, are tailor-made for you. Now, I'm not going to get tempted with, Dennis, you're a terrible golfer. I don't like golf, never liked golf, didn't want to go golfing. So that wouldn't be a legitimate tailor-made temptation for me. Dennis, you're a terrible golfer. Dennis, you're a terrible golfer. Go to the store. Dennis, you're a terrible golfer. Go to go in your backyard. Dennis, you're a terrible Who cares? That's not a legitimate temptation. But we all have temptations that are tailor-made for us individually. What's yours? What's in your wallet? <laughs> huh? What's in your heart? Huh? What's in your heart? What temptation is tailor-made for you? Because therein is the area of refocusing. Focus keys, so to speak. But all temptation, it's made for us to hinder what we were called to be and what we were called to do. Are you going to go before the Lord and say, God, what are some of my excuses? Because don't forget, you fortified excuses. You, you gave them the stamp of approval. In other words, you ratified them and said they're legitimate. And God's saying, no, they're not. Who's going to have the last word in this? God said excuses are not. Well, there's some focus keys. First thing you got to realize, uh, key number one, we have no independent spirit. That's your flesh. Each person is drawn away. Drawn away from his spirit with the five senses. The second key, because when we're weak, he's strong. 
Temptation comes as an opportunity to respond better. To know that it's tailor-made for me, I want to make some progress in that area. That temptation is tailor-made for me. The key is I am not going to function independently of God. When you function independently of God, you'll make an excuse. When you're with him, you're going, God, how do I respond? Second key is this will be very comforting for a lot of believers. When you're tempted, it's not sin. He'll condemn you with something, but you don't have to take the condemnation. That's a tool, the accuser of the brethren. Temptation. Temptation isn't sin. It's how you respond to it. You give in to it, and uh, that's sin. So don't live under condemnation when you're tempted. See it as an opportunity to say, God, if that's an area I'm going to develop, I'm going to develop in that area because it's tailor-made for me, and if I keep getting it in the same area, there's an area there that I want to get stronger in you. I need you. So I want to learn to respond rather than react, in other words. And God has given us the power to resist. I have the Spirit of God in me. He's going to be my Master and Lord, and I'm going to bring every thought captive, every emotion captive to the obedience of Christ. We need to remember it's another key, but it's, I think we already said it, that this key <laughs> is that temptation is inevitable. So don't think you're going to live some kind of life where all of a sudden it goes away. Temptation is inevitable. Each one is tempted when by his own evil desires he's dragged away and enticed. <laughs> That's the part. If you start to feel like you're being dragged away, you're given into it. What was it in the message? It was like, uh, uh, lust has a child. It's called a baby called sin. Sin grows up to be a real killer. But that's the same principle. You tempt each one is tempted when he is by his own evil desire. Evil desire means simply your flesh wants to override God. And enticed, tempted when our mind and body are stirred by our flesh. We are delivered from the indwelling sin, but we're not out of calling distance. <laughs> you know, we're not out of calling distance. So you've got to be sensitive to the walk that you have in God. But again, Think in terms of that magnet. Think in terms of draw nigh to God, they'll draw nigh to you. Learn to stay drop down. Learn to not just go drop down when you have a problem. Learn to abide. Stay there. Dual awareness. Pay attention to the precious cargo. Right now, I'm carrying the pearl of great price. And I'm just carrying that in the field of my heart. And that's the preeminent relationship right now. I'm wealthy. I've got the pearl of great price. I have all the treasures of wisdom hidden in him, in me. Wow. I could end up being quite wise if I give in to God. Imagine that. We could have a lot of wisdom. It says if anybody asks, I'm asking. Well, here's the way you got to go about it, though. I've got to give him the, as the principal thing and the, and the source or the motive the power to reveal himself in me. The beautiful part about that magnetic pull is that's another key. Is the magnet's there. It'll work. Use it. Draw an eye to God, he'll draw an eye to you. The magnet works. The other key is understanding that if temptation seems particularly strong. This is worth writing down. If temptation seems particularly strong, you can assume there is a root issue, and you need to ask God, where did that get started? How do I know, how do I know if, it's, if it, there's a root issue? Well, there, there's characteristics. A lie that manifests to us as a repetitive, intrusive thought. Repetitive, intrusive thought. It, it 
seems like it's a gangbuster busting you all the time, entering into your thought life no matter what you are, were engaged in. It's always connected to a negative emotion. It operates in an ongoing cycle. It's that same old temptation again and again. Very intrusive, but it's the same old story. As a matter of fact, it might have historical evidence because that's what it uses. Well, that's the way I am. It's been like that forever. Don't buy into that. You know what that is? An excuse. <laughs> that's an excuse. The historical fact does not measure up to equality with Scripture. Scripture trumps historical proof. I don't care what you can prove. I don't care how bad you've been your whole life. God says that's an excuse. Do something about it. And besides that, one of the attributes it has, it will attract perpetrators. It's intermittent, comes and goes, but it has a life of its own. Here's the, here's the way it works, and this is something you can use. Put, write this down in your Bible in a little corner somewhere. But here's the way it works. It starts out as a suggestion. If it's just a suggestion, you can eh, I'm not, eh, dismiss it. But what we're talking about now is focus. The second step is when it becomes a distraction, when it's actually interfering with the plans and the purposes that God has for you. And then thirdly, it dominates. In other words, it rules. Suggestion to distraction to domination. You don't want anything to dominate other than the Lordship of Jesus. If it dominates you, it tells you you need to deal with the root. Those are indications, characteristics of a root. It blocks your ability to hear the truth. <clears throat> <clears throat> some of the people that are not making the kind of progress they could be making it's because they're they're um, <clears throat> they've got root issues that are blocking them from hearing the truth so even if their head says I agree that the Bible says that their heart is far far away deal with the root and you'll be able to take receive the truth do you ever see something it's just like you can tell them 25,000 times and it just bounces off it's because they've already have built up a fortress, uh, walls, uh, defenses against the truth. Does that sound scriptural? They've, they've exalted something above the truth of God. Even if they will humble themselves mildly and say, no, I agree, the Bible says that, but it's still there. No. <clears throat> we have to learn to focus our Jesus walks through walls. He can break down those defenses and focus on the new creation, which is the real you. We need to be God-focused. We're saying everything. People misconstrue even a lot of times what we're teaching because they get in their head rather than their spirit. Everything we're teaching is three elements in God. God-focus, how to be God-searched, and how to be God protected by the peace. Kingdom life people know this inside out and backwards. But there are many, many multitudes of Christians who still live by self-focused, what's in it for me, self-focused, self-searched, they're going to figure it out. Self-protected, they put up the wall thinking that's going to keep them safe. Isn't that a sad documentary? God's basically saying this, God-focused, God-search, and God-protected is everything we teach. If you hear it, self-focused, self-searched, or self-protected, you've got a wall. Because it isn't about self. God wants the opposite. Focus is the opposite of blank. <laughs> There's no blank. You focus on God and His sufficiency. God requires us to seek Him, to put on the armor of light, to put on the Lord Jesus, to put on the new man, to put on the breastplate. 
And every one of these put on mercies. And every one of these indications put on is in dual means you have to sink into him to get it. You, in and of yourself, that independent self can't do it. So, Father, we're just going to say, in the days ahead, there's going to be many distractions in the, in the world, in the church, in our personal lives. But God is saying that I'm going to teach you to focus. I'm going to teach you to focus on me. And you're going to deal with anything that comes against the character of God, the truth of God's word, the new creation reality of who you are, anything that comes against your personal worth, anything that comes against competence. And God's going to basically say in these days, they that focus on me are going to receive the fruit that's necessary. That draw nigh to God, he'll draw nigh to you. And you're going to see the fruit of it. Remember the three points. Any, you find your excuses. You remember, I want God's reality. First, I'll deal with the root, get rid of the root. But then you want what? The truth. I'll take that truth. I'll cultivate that truth. I'll pursue that truth until I can see fruit. And the best part, and we'll finish with this, <laughs> the best part is your worst temptation that was tailor-made for you on the other side of that will be your strongest anointing. That in itself is worth going for because God preordained those things before the foundation of the earth that you would walk in them. Excuses prevent you from walking in the various things that God called you to be and to do. And the empowerment's there. That's the definition of grace. Grace is the empowerment, the ability to be and to do all that he called you to do. The personal presence of Jesus in you. To be and to do all that he called you to be, all that he called you to do. So we thank you right now, God, that there is an impartation going forth, even, even on... Um, those that are watching by video. Right now, I just release that God is going to stir up your excuses and he's going to bring them to the service for whosoever wants to move forward and upward in the days ahead. You're going to, he'll teach you how to deal and remove bitter roots and, and excuses. And when you repent of those excuses and receive forgiveness for them, get even where they started then God is going to give you the truth and the reality that's going to be so well written on the tablet of your heart that you will own it for the rest of your life. You will, it will be everything that was an excuse is a foreign element to the days that you walk in and the days ahead. Thank God Gideon, Joshua, Moses didn't live in their excuse forever. They dealt with it, and so can you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for amen. joining us. You've been listening to Drs. Dennis Clark and Jennifer Clark from Full Stature Ministries. To explore more life-transforming resources and deepen your faith journey, please visit us at forgive123.com and our online school at teamembassy.com. All rights reserved under applicable law. For details, please see our copyright policy on our website. Again, that's forgive123.com.